serious sign of hip, hip, serious hip problems, and we'll talk about that later. But <clears throat> you know, trauma. You cannot have post <clears throat> post menopausal females. They can have uh, osteoporosis. They can have hip fractures. And then here, like I was saying, here's some pictures of where you're talking about looking at the ASIS and the PSIS. It's not going to be a complete level line. It's going to be tilted, but you're going to just want to pay attention to, if it's like this, if they have hyperlordosis. <clears throat> and this, again, again, more applies to the lumbar and the pelvis rather than the hip per se, but just general observation types of things. And then, of course, you're going to look, at how's their weight bearing? Are they bearing weight normally on both legs? And then when we talk about the hip dislocations, there's things like this, but you're not really going to be dealing with acute hip dislocations. And then you have things in the femoral triangle that you're going to palpate. You've got the femoral artery in there. You've got some uh, inguinal lymph nodes. And then there's going to be the bursa on the, you're not really going to, the psoas bursa obviously is going to be in there pretty deep, but you have the Greater trochanic bursa and the ischial bursa. So then, five minute neuro is pretty much the same type of stuff as lumbar pelvis, right? So there's your Patrick Faber test. Stitchfield test is basically what you're doing is it's you put the hip into this position and then press down. I'm, I mean, you press up, I'm going to resist. And that's just for hip pathology. So again, you're looking for pain in the hip. But it could be pain in other areas, right? It could be in the grain, in the groin. Um, you could have SI problems or back pain. Okay. So although it's technically a contracted tissue test, whereas we're, we're doing resistance against, against muscle, we're do, using it to assess the joint, the joints and the bones. All right, now there's going to be a series of a couple tests that have to do with hip flexor contracture. Okay, what's the muscle that goes across the hip joint and the knee joint on the front of the legs? Uh, yeah, that's true. But um, that's part of the quadriceps. What's that? The biceps. Oh, yeah. It's femoris, but it's not biceps, it's what? Rectus femoris. Rectus femoris is one of the quadriceps. That's the only one that crosses the hip and the knee. And the sartorius, so that does cross both, but that's a different muscle. But <clears throat> you can have, if you have a tight rectus, it's going to cause, when, when the knee flexes, it's going to cause the hip to flex. So there's a couple tests here. So <clears throat> what you're doing is you're flexing the hip and then you're assessing what happens to that other side. So if this uh, right hip joint is contracted, that other knee is going to raise up. Okay. So you're just looking for the other leg to raise off the table, and that's just showing that it could actually be the hip joint itself. It could maybe the hip joint capsule, the hip capsule is tight, and it's causing it to raise up like that, or it could be the rectus femoris. <clears throat> and now this gets more specifically to see if it's the rectus femoris. So what you're doing here is you're basically doing that same situation here, but in this case you want to be at the edge of the table <clears throat> so that the knee's over the edge like that. And then in this case what you're looking for is that hip joint may be okay, but you, you'll see that, that's, that the, th the calf will raise. The knee will extend. So if it's a hip flexor contracture, you're going to look for this to happen. Whereas if it's just rectus femoris, what you're going to see is this is going to happen. And then you can, you can go like this if that knee raises up. You can push to see if it'll go down. Because sometimes a muscle is going to have a tendency to short to, to pull up when it can, but <clears throat> to make sure that if it really is contracted, if see he's got more room to go, so we know yeah that's okay, it's all right. 
So you're looking for two different things. One is if it's a hip flexor contractor, you're going to see this kind of thing. Whereas if it's specifically just the rectus femoris, then you're going to see this. Okay. And then overs, what this is for is for, it's the, for the TFL. And then in this situation, basically, the TFL is on the side here. So what its action is going to do is it's going to come up like this. So it's kind of like a drop arm test, except in this case, you're not looking for it to drop. You're looking for it to not come down smoothly. If, this is, if there's a problem in here, or if, the, if it's caught up in here, you say, I want you to let your leg drop down. Just let go. Okay, so it's coming down smoothly. If it kind of gets stuck, or there's some catching involved, then that's what you're looking for. There would be a problem with the TFL. So again, that same position, it's the same that we did a couple other tests, right? If he's getting some numbness or tingling on the front of the leg, it's kind of like a femoral nerve. <clears throat> the traction test. So, if you have some neuro signs, it could be the femoral nerve problem, or if there's tenderness or pain over the greater trochanter, then it can be the bursitis. Sorry, the overs test is the dropping things, or this one? Both. Yeah, this, that's what this is. See, okay, positive test leg remains abducted, so it's not it's not dropping down smoothly. Okay. It may get kind of stuck up like that. Because the, the picture is different that you did, so I, was, I want to make sure that the overstance is dropping, yeah. but this is a different. Uh, you know, I think that might be the wrong picture. Yeah. Go by what I did and not so much by that picture. Okay. So that might be the wrong picture. Right. So that's so what, yeah, it's what just, you did is the not that one. Yeah, so, so don't. don't there's a, there's a picture of it in the book. It's basically like this, and then I'm going to just let your leg drop down. And bring it down like that. You're looking for it to, like, get stuck. If, like, if this, if this band is tight, you know, you'll feel like a tight band in here, and it may not drop down smoothly. So I'll have to fix that picture. Okay, so then we'll practice those, and then you can break down the tables. So, what bones are involved in the hip? Well, before we get into this, let's go to these points here. It's the largest bone in the joint in the body. It's the most stable. It's a pretty deep ball and socket joint as opposed to the shoulder. As a amount of pathology that can occur in the hip. And then hip pain can refer to other areas. It can refer to the back, can refer down the leg. All right, so then as far as the bones that are involved, we talked before about you have the, each side of the pelvis is composed of three different bones, and then you have the actual femur. And then the, the hip joint itself is the uh, acetabular joint. So it's a ball and socket. It's a multi-axial joint. So you can have, you know, circumduction like this. So there's a deep socket, and it does have a labrum, just kind of like in the shoulder, also had a labrum, there's a labrum in the hip too. And then there's the ligaments, we'll talk more specifically about those in a second. It's a pretty stable joint, because it's pretty well supported by the ligaments. In the shoulder, we were talking about how that's supported more with muscle, rather than because the, the ball and socket joint is pretty shallow, whereas in the hip, it's supported more by the actual structure of the joint itself because it has a deep socket. So here's, again, you have that labrum, which is a rim around the outside. 